right. How we doing, Pork Fest? How's everyone feeling today? It's uh, a little cold today. It's not that bad. It's New Hampshire. Get over it, pussies. We're fine. Boy, Scott Horton, what a, what a tough act to follow. How about Scott Horton, everyone? Give him another round of applause. So I don't know if we have any uh, Naturalist Capitalist fans in the house, do we? And then, so if you watch Naturalist Capitalist, you must also watch the Four Horsemen. We've got Four Horsemen fans in here. We've got this great shirt, Reed's selling them. Uh, make sure you buy one, because that's how I'm getting home, so. Seriously, buy one. I don't know how we're doing this. We're, that's what's happening, Reed, right? I'm going to use that for gas money. I don't have to do that other thing. Okay. <laughs> but if you watch The Four Horsemen, you know that my role on it is a little bit of comedy and a, to inject a little bit of light and humor into the darkness of the world that us liberty-minded folk tend to focus on. So I brought a couple of my friends to help introduce Reed. Um, for starters, I had to bring my good friend, the 45th President of the United States, insurrectionist, fat orange Cheeto trust fund baby, Donald Trump. How we doing, guys? How we doing, Pork Fest? Are we doing well? Okay, okay. Excuse me, excuse me. So Scott Horton wrote the book enough already? Well, very low energy, okay? Because I wrote the book, The Art of the Deal, Scott. I got you beat there, okay? In The Art of the Deal, we've translated into 4,000 languages, Klingon, Russian, Mexican, Dothraki. We even translated Art of the Deal into Pig Latin so Rosie O'Donnell could read it, okay? Think about it, think about it. But I do, I love Reed Coverdale, he does liberty, nobody does liberty better than Reed Coverdale, the naturalist capitalist, believe me. He's an unbelievable talent, he's very handsome. And he's hung, quite frankly, okay? Almost as big as me, almost as big as Trump Tower Jr., but not quite. Not quite. And Melania knows if she disparages Trump Tower Jr., I will sue her ass. I will. And I can get $1 billion per inch, so that would be a $2.5 billion lawsuit. It'd be a big one. And then I brought my friend, former Minnesota Governor Jesse Ventura. We're the Ventura fans at Pork Fest. You guys are about as high energy as Jeb Bush. Come on. We need more energy from you. Give me a waterboard, Dick Cheney, in 15 minutes, and I'll get him to confess to the Sharon Tate murders. And then I brought my good friend, Alex Jones from Infowars.com. We got any Infowarriors in the audience here, folks? Infowars! <laughs> folks. We're turning the frogs friggin' gay. Jeremy Coffin's gonna turn the Pentagon bay gay, okay? Google it, folks, it's a real thing. Infowars.com. If Hillary Clinton comes back and runs and she gets elected in 2024, folks, we are looking at a thousand years of darkness and we can't have that. Go on Infowars.com right now, type in info code, promo code, read Coverdale, and you get 50% off my anti-New World Order dick pill red pills. <laughs> Only there right now, folks. And then, we brought my little friend, Senator Lindsey Graham, from the great state of South Carolina. I know Scott Horton was talking about Yemen. I got kind of excited over there, Scott. Ain't nothing makes me more excited than war. Killing people, killing brown people. Lindsey's good at appropriating money to kill brown people. And I, I will make this promise, Porkfest. I will personally go over on the Arabian Gulf. I will go on that aircraft carrier and I will rub lotion on all them boys on that aircraft carrier, I promise. All right, enough of that, enough of that. So, uh, Reed's awesome. I've been doing the Four Horsemen with Reed um, for over a year now with another base individual by the name of Ryan Dawson. We got Ryan Dawson fans in the house. And um, what a treat it is to, to uh, once a month get on there and bring on someone else who has an interesting viewpoint and a perspective and Liberty brings a lot of people together in this journey so far. Reed and I have hung out with Roger Waters from Pink Floyd. We went to a conference where he was speaking about Israel and standing for the Palestinian people and speaking out against that. And then a couple weeks ago, we went to Houston and hung out with Ron Paul. Ron Paul is up there talking about freedom and liberty and gold and Bitcoin. Ooh. 
and the young people like Reed Coverdale. So thank you very much, everybody. It's my honor and my privilege to introduce to you my friend, the host of The Naturalist Capitalist, Mr. Reed Coverdale. Hey guys, if you don't already subscribe to Jackman Radio on YouTube, go do it. You won't regret it. That's just a little, he, he was a little bit uh, family friendly here. If you want to really laugh, go check out his show. So. <laughs> and then uh, I just got banned off of Twitter for the second time. Uh, there, <laughs> there's a guy who's been uh, banned. Uh, he got banned off of AOL and, and like MySpace in 2005. If you want to go check out uh, Ryan Dawson at ANC Report because you're not going to find him anywhere else. So I'm different than a lot of libertarians in the way that I actually didn't become a libertarian by reading books or watching podcasts. Um, for me, I actually started becoming skeptical of the government uh, when I started working. Uh, do we have any blue collar workers in the crowd here? Okay. We got a couple. We're not all upper echelon elitists here. That's good. So, um, but when you start working and you see this top down centralized, um, you know, th this, top, this top down centralized system that's running things like the electric utilities, which are about as close as you can get to a government without being a government, you realize that. That's not a very smart system. There's tons of waste, there's tons of fraud, there's tons of problems. And uh, that started making me skeptical from a young age. And then uh, if you're a truck driver and you have to deal with the police, that starts making you pretty skeptical of law enforcement from a pretty young age. So um, I started working when I was 16, uh, pretty much full time. I was working 45 hours a week during the summer and then a couple hours um, every day after school. And then uh, when I turned 18 and graduated, I went into the workforce full time, working 50 hours a week. And I got my CDL uh, about 10 years ago now, and I've done tons of different jobs. I've worked on power lines in New Hampshire. I've worked at a uh, lumber yard here in New Hampshire. Uh, I did roofing out in Colorado with a bunch of Mexicans for a little while. And then I also uh, just finished two years of over the road, heavy haul truck driving based out of Utah. And I'm back here in New Hampshire now. Um, I recommend this state to everybody. We got cool things going on here. So from a pretty uh, early stage, I started realizing that the regulatory state is not there to keep people safe. It's there to control them. And that's really it. I mean, if you, you know, as libertarians, we're skeptical of three-letter agencies, you know, CIA, FBI, IRS, that was a pretty earlier one for me, but also the four-letter agencies like OSHA, you know, they're, they're not really there for the purpose that they want us to think that they're there for. And anyone who tries to work on a job where OSHA shows up and is regulating things and is keeping a close eye on you and you actually have to follow the rules that you pretend you follow all the time when you're not being supervised, you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But uh, the state is not there to protect you. It is there to crush workers, kill competition, destroy the environment and prop up big business. And I think a lot of us have seen that, you know, uh, two extremities in the last couple of years with lockdowns, uh, with you know seeing the big corporations get boosted up while the little guys get crushed. But this goes back a long way. Uh, the higher the regulations get, the more the small businesses die because they can't keep up with it. And then the big corporations that can handle you know raising their minimum wage or uh, you know converting all their trucks to run on DEF or you know getting new trucks or whatever. Um, all these big businesses can survive these changes where small businesses have to be eaten up by larger corporations or just die. Um, so the, the state really destroys three major things. The first one is your intelligence. So the apparent goal here is to bring people who are absolute morons 
to somewhat of a status quo level where we could all function. But instead of doing that, they turn everybody into morons. So I, I don't know, is anyone here familiar with the, the handicapper general story? If you were in my dad's class, you'd know it. But uh, this is a story, uh, it's a dystopian future where anyone's uh, uniqueness, whether it's a, a beauty that they have or a special ability to sing or if they're athletic or whatever, they're just handicapped to bring everyone down to the same level. So if you're an intelligent person, you had to wear these headphones that scramble your thoughts that bring you down to the same level as everybody else. That is really what OSHA and the regulatory state do to people who are intelligent. They, they just make you into an idiot because you're not allowed to think for yourself anymore. You have to follow this certain checkbox of rules. Uh, so I have some personal experience with this. Um, I forget what year it was, it was like six or seven years ago, I was working inside a substation and we had to pick up this shipping container and it's a 20 foot long, eight foot wide, eight foot tall shipping container. And so there was a crane picking it up and I climbed up on the roof to hook the chains up to pick it up and this guy came screaming across the yard at me that I couldn't be up on top of that shipping container without a harness. And I was like, well, where am I supposed to attach this harness to? So the harnesses we had, you'd have, a land, or you'd have a harness that goes around your upper body, and then there's a lanyard coming off the top of your back that's five feet long. And this is an eight foot tall shipping container. So if I fall off the shipping container, I'm still gonna hit the ground. It's just gonna stop me from rolling a little bit or something. <laughs> um, and so I, I told him there's nowhere uh, the only places I can hook into this thing are on the corners because there are holes where I can clip, uh, you know, clip the lanyard on. And he said, well, you've you got to figure something out. So the uh, compromise we arrived at was I was allowed to use a step ladder without a harness. So now I'm still at the same height, but instead of standing on a, oops, sorry, instead of standing on a 20 foot long, eight foot wide platform, I'm now on top of a rickety step ladder hooking these chains up to this crane to pick up this shipping container. But I'm following the rules. You know, that's all that matters. That's all they care about. It, it, it takes the critical thought of what you're doing out of your task. Um, you know, my dad's an English teacher, and uh, especially when I was in his class, you know, 10, 11 years ago, the school was really pushing all these new rubrics uh, for grading papers. So instead of focusing on writing and focusing on telling a story and focusing on interesting um, your readers, you just have to make sure that you've got all these checked off, uh, you know, th this checked off itinerary inside uh, your, your paper you're writing. So you have an introductory sentence, three supporting sentences, and a conclusion sentence, and that is a paragraph. Instead of like in that paragraph trying to educate the reader or give them something interesting that they didn't know. And that's what they've done with work. Instead of trying to accomplish something or trying to be safer or trying to do something in an efficient way, they have just created this system where you have a checkbox and as long as you're checking off that list, you're good. You don't have to worry about anything else. Uh, my uncle out in Colorado who used to uh, own a roofing company and they were going to replace this roof that was like 500 feet wide. Um, and it was, it, was, it was like outside of a coal mine or something, I forget where it was. But they ended up turning down the job because they were gonna have to have harnesses on in the middle of the roof when it's 500 feet wide. And they were gonna have to have all these tag lines running all these harnesses over the, you know, all over the place and they turned it down because it's just ridiculous. You can't even do your job anymore. Uh, last I knew, OSHA regulations, you needed to wear a harness when you're four feet off the ground. So what we've done is whenever some moron fucks something up, we decide that we need to make a law so this can't happen again. Instead of just accepting, okay, you know what, that guy's a fucking moron and he shouldn't have done that. Um, this is similar, but the state also kills your creativity. So it's not just your intelligence, but trying to find a creative way to get something done faster or to do it more efficiently, save money. 
save fuel, whatever it is, they, they completely uh, destroy that. So a great example of this is in the trucking industry, which I've been part of. Uh, they have recently created this system where you need electronic logs to record all the time you're working, all the time you're driving. You used to do it on paper logs, and the law actually hasn't changed since like the 60s as far as what the hours of service were. But when you just have a paper log, you know, you're allowed to drive 11 hours a day, you're allowed to work three hours additional to that 11 hours a day, and then you need to take 10 hours off. So if you're coming up on 10 hours and 40 minutes, and you know it's like 22 minutes to your next stop, if you have a paper log, you can just use you know, a margin of error and say, okay, well, I'll just go two minutes over, and it won't matter, I'll just mark it down on my paper log, I made it in time. Now, that's impossible. If you're one second over, it shows up as a violation on your electronic log. So now, if you're 52 minutes away from the next place that you can safely stop, and your clock is gonna run out in 48 minutes, you're either encouraged to speed and go as fast as you can, break the law, you know, not take any uh, cautious, um, you know, uh, not, not be cautious at all and just, and just go for it and go as fast as you can and get there before your clock runs out. Or you have to stop and waste 48 minutes that you could have spent driving. So then you, you're running behind schedule uh, or you're just cutting corners trying to get things done on time. It's, it's very typical that, you know, these types of things happen uh, as a result of these types of rules. Um, so here, here's an example. Uh, where, you know, you have a law that sort of makes sense at face value. Uh, if you're hauling oversize, or, or sorry, overweight loads uh, in Wyoming, you can't haul more than one unit. So if you're grossing over 80,000 pounds, you can only be hauling one piece of equipment. So if I weigh 100,000 pounds, I can just have one crusher on there. I can't, like, try to squeeze a you know, like an excavator on with the crusher is basically what the rule is supposed to mean, which I guess, you know, whatever, makes a little bit of sense. Um, and then if you are hauling one unit, it has to all be in working order. So in other words, you can't haul an excavator with two buckets because only one bucket can actually be attached and you can't have like another bucket sitting on top of it or you can't haul a loader uh, with the forks and the bucket sitting on top of the forks. It's got to all be connected, ready to go. You know, whatever, makes a little bit of sense, I guess. So I was hauling a 70,000 pound crusher from Denver, Colorado back to Salt Lake City. And I get to the scale coming into Wyoming. They pull me over, I stop, and they start crawling over, crawling all over the machine, looking in every nook and cranny looking for anything they can find, and they say, oh, sorry, we can't let you go through here. And I said, why is that? And they said, well, you have a toolbox on this crusher, and it's got a couple wrenches on it, wrenches inside of it, and that is not considered in working order, so we're calling this a second unit. <sighs> so I had these wrenches that were like this long, each of them probably weighed about 60 pounds or so, and they're calling that, they're, they're, they're treating that like I'm hauling a friggin' excavator along with the crusher. So they told me I could throw them in the dumpster or I could have someone else come and get them. And I'm 400 miles away from Salt Lake City here. I'm, you know, going up I-25 on the border of Wyoming. So I argued with them for like four hours and they would not let me go. And the thing that's hilarious about this is I have chains and binders that I'm not using that are sitting in the belly of the trailer. These weigh more than the wrenches, you know. So the, and, and also, I, w I was hauling a 70,000 pound crusher, but my trailer was rated for hauling like up to 95,000 pounds. So I could be hauling something way, way heavier uh, but just because of the way this law is written, they were, you know, they were nailing me on this. So what we did is I just called a towing company down the street, and they came and got the wrenches, and then I drove, you know, they let me out of the way station, I drove down an exit, and we met up, and they just threw the wrenches back in the toolbox, and I went back to Salt Lake City. <laughs> But 
but the state is incredibly obtuse. Like, I mean, I could have been lucky and run into some cop who just didn't care. And I mean, think about it. Any cops that you guys like, it's because they're not doing what they're supposed to do, right? It's because they're not doing their job. They're just like, eh, whatever, just slow down a little bit if you don't mind. Or, you know, like, okay, I'm not gonna, I know you're driving with an open beer can, but I'm not gonna take it from you. Like, those are the cops we like, the ones who aren't doing what they're supposed to do. So a lot of people feel like this type of stuff is the state run amok, but this is a feature of the state, not a bug. The bug is the good cop you like that doesn't you know, throw you in jail for something stupid because he's not doing what he's supposed to do. Um, and the last thing that the state kills is your soul. Uh, and you know I'm an atheist, so you know you can take soul to mean whatever you want. I don't if you know if you believe in God or if you don't or whatever. Whatever that is that gives us our creative drive and our desire to keep going, the state wants to kill that. And you know that's become incredibly obvious over the last two years with lockdowns and mandates. So just think about how they treated us over the last two years. You know when COVID first hit the essential worker was completely arbitrary. It was whatever they deemed as, you know, someone who was still worthy of having a job. And if you didn't meet that requirement, sorry, but you can't work. Your business has to be closed, uh, or you have to work from home, you have to figure something else out. Um, you know, and <laughs> with the decisions that they make about everything else, why would we trust them to decide who is essential and who isn't? essential. And then the few people that they deemed essential enough to keep working, they were lauded as heroes, right? Like the truck drivers who were delivering the toilet paper and the sanitizer and the, uh, you know, the nurses and the doctors who were helping everyone who was sick. They were absolute heroes. We should exalt them. They're just the best thing in the world. What about a year later? How are those heroes treated? If you won't inject this substance into your body, then you get fired. <laughs> so, I mean, they don't care about you. They, they want to act like, you know, this is to protect you and make you safe. But then they change the rules 18 different times. You know, originally you have to wear a mask, or sorry, originally you don't wear a mask because we need all the essential workers to have them. You don't need one. And then it turns out, oh, actually, no, you do need one. It's incredibly dangerous not to go outside and talk to people if you don't have a mask. And then, you know, they change it three or four times. And then the vaccine, like you have to get it because you won't spread COVID if you have the vaccine. And then actually you can still spread it, but you won't die from it. Actually, no, you still can die from it if you have it. But, you know, like it, it just kept changing and changing and changing. And it just became incredibly obvious uh, to anyone who's paying attention that they don't know what they're talking about and they don't give a shit about you. You are completely expendable. So... My point is, like, we've seen this, you know, magnified over the last two years. People who might have not paid attention to this before uh, suddenly had to, but this is something that has been going on for a very long time. And it's been in pretty much every industry, and it's always been about control. It's never been about making things safer or, you know, protecting the environment. I, I love that one, protecting the environment. So. Um, I'm someone, I've done the 48, 4,000 footers in New Hampshire. I've been to almost every national park around the country, done tons of uh, hiking and nature. I absolutely love the outdoors. I'm an avid outdoorsman. So, of course, I care about the environment. Uh, but when I was working on, um, you know, on power lines, when we were working in a swamp, we had to bring these big wooden mats and lay them down in the swamp so the uh, machines wouldn't sink into the... Uh, into the peat moss and destroy anything or whatever. And that makes sense on a surface level. But then you start expanding the definition of a swamp to anywhere within a square mile that you see a cattail or something. So then you bring in all these wooden mats in that you don't need, laying them out for miles, burning all the diesel in the trucks to bring them back and forth. And, you know, there, there were some times where all we had to do was drive across a little stream and go put a pole in and then, you know, switch the wires over to it and yank the old pole out and come back out. But instead, we've got to bring, you know, I don't know, 400 mats to build a bridge 
And you end up killing way more than if you just went in and out and you know, just did, had a minimalist approach to your job. And that, that's just what the government has done all the way through. Like every single thing that you care about, whether it's you know, not dying from COVID or uh, you know, being safe when you go to work or having companies respect the environment, the government has had the absolute opposite effect in all those things. Um, I also think like with a lot of these laws were actually, you know, the LP New Hampshire made a tweet about repealing child labor laws. Anyone remember that tweet when that came out? <laughs> and it got a lot of backlash, but you know, people think that if we repealed child labor laws that you'd have six year olds working in coal mines again, where it's just ridiculous. I mean, the point we've gotten to culturally would not allow for that. I mean, a lot of the things that we've come a long way in is because of the amount of information that makes it around now and the amount we know about, um, you know, like, I mean, for a great, for a great, a great example would be like uh, asbestos. Like, people aren't going to start using asbestos again just because it's not illegal anymore. If you know that cutting it and leaving it up on a wall for decades and it starts shedding, that it can give people mesothelioma, you know, that has a much larger effect than actually trying to ban a substance or whatever. And the same thing goes with safety laws. Like, do you think people are stop, gonna stop using rubber gloves on power lines if, you know, we start <laughs> rolling regulations back? You think they're just gonna go up and start getting electrocuted and wonder why that's happening? It's probably not the case. You know, I, I, think, a great, I think a great litmus test for a safety rule is would you still follow that rule if it weren't mandatory? Because I guarantee you, everyone would be wearing rubber gloves when they go to work on power lines. Um, you know, but a lot of these extra rules that we've added don't do anything to make us safer, and they actually take your mind off the ball. So anyone here familiar with Mike Rowe from the Dirty Job Show? Have you guys heard his safety third bit before? You ever heard him talk about that? So he says, he makes the case that we emphasize safety so much that we stop being safe because we're not worried about the dangers of whatever it is we're working on. It was what I was saying earlier about just worrying about checking off a checklist instead of actually thinking about uh, you know, the electricity pulsing through the line or the 80,000 pound load that you've got going down the road at 70 miles per hour. Instead of thinking about that, you're just thinking about, okay, am I gonna get to my truck stop before my log runs out and you know, is my, you know, do, do I have my reflective triangles with me and blah, 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 thinking about all that stuff instead of thinking about the task at hand and what you're doing. Um, and what he says is we should be saying safety third instead of safety first because, you know, when you have to think about the job, you just are safer. He gives the example he was working on a crab fishing boat out in the Bering Strait off the coast of Alaska and it was just incredibly dangerous, huge waves everywhere, the boat's rocking back and forth, you know, lob, uh, traps are falling off the side or whatever. And he goes and tells the captain like, hey man, this is crazy. Why are there no regulations? And the captain tells him, my job is to get you home rich. If you wanna get home alive, that's on you. And so then he goes back out there and he's working and he's making sure he's grabbing onto everything. He's looking and checking his surroundings, making sure nothing's gonna fall on top of him because safety then becomes your responsibility instead of the administrative state's responsibility and everyone else's responsibility. It's a very libertarian philosophy. If you take care of yourself first, then you can do a better job and take care of other people around you. But if we're just relying on the government, OSHA, you know, all these regulations to keep us safe, it's not going to work. We're just gonna end up with more and more ridiculous laws like we've already had. Um, so, like, I, I'm up here complaining about a lot, so what do I think we should do? I do think the, the answer is pretty simple. It's probably not gonna surprise you guys. Like, I think we should just start rolling stuff back. It's gotten ridiculous. Every time somebody makes a mistake, we don't need to add a new law. Maybe we just need to admit that that guy was a dumbass and did something stupid. And we saw this come to its logical conclusion with COVID lockdowns, the idea of like, if it saves one life, 
That is the same basic mentality that OSHA has about the workplace. If it saves one life, we'll make it illegal for people to not wear a harness when they're four feet in the air. And so it's the same as making every healthy 20-year-old dude wear a mask as it is making everyone wear a harness four feet high in the air. It's the same mentality, it's the same problem, and you end up with the same amount of stupidity and the same amount of waste and the same amount of, uh, you know, just the, just the same amount of uh, ridiculousness. So that's basically my case. Um, that's all I got. Anyone got questions? Reed, uh, when is the Tower Gang podcast going to be? Oh, yeah. Uh, when is it again? Tomorrow night at 9? 9 p.m. Well, yeah. The, yeah, so at the Mises Tent tomorrow night, who's going to be there anyway? Did we decide? You, me, Clint, and I believe Richard Burroughs. All right, so tomorrow night. We're going to have a live podcast at Tower Gang. Me, Toad, Clint, and Richard Grove at the Mises Tent. Make sure you come there. Oh, yeah, that's the other thing. I know Eric mentioned it, but I've got T-shirts. So I've got this design, and I've got a few other ones. If you guys want to uh, buy them, I'll take them for... Uh, I'll sell them for $30 or for an ounce of silver, whichever one you have. So... But... Richard Grove's awesome, by the way. Everybody should turn out for that. <clears throat> um, I just wanted to say, I mean, I appreciate what you do, man. Uh, sincerely. I know we're friends, so I'm just going to be really heartfelt. But um, I, I think that you're making a big difference. I think that, you know, I speak for the white-collar community, and you speak for the blue. So thank you for doing that. Uh, I just wanted to ask what you think is, is the blue-collar revolution coming? You know, are, are there enough blue collar people that are actually seeing what you've experienced and coming to the same conclusions? Uh, what do you think? Yeah, so the difference, uh, I'm gonna insult you here a little bit, Clint. The difference between the blue collar community and the white collar community is the blue collar community are the people on the ground who have to deal with reality. So it's the, it's the ideas versus the application. <laughs> Yeah, so if there are any engineers in here, I'm sorry, but like if you're talking with an engineer who's like seven states away telling you that the holes and two pieces of steel are supposed to be able to line up for a bolt to go through them to put a substation together, and you're like, dude, I'm here, and it just doesn't fit, you know, they, they won't hear it. It's just like, no, it has to, it has to. The computer says it will, the computer says it will. And, uh, you know, with the lockdowns and everything, that was very theoretical, you know, like if we lock down, this will work, it'll save this many lives. If everybody gets vaccinated, it will stop this from happening. When the reality was very different, like the lockdowns, lots of studies have shown that they actually could have caused more deaths in the end. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the uh, economic intrusions that we had with quantitative easing, bailing out, big businesses shutting down entire sections of the economy. That certainly didn't help. They told us we weren't gonna have inflation uh, or that it would be transitory if it did happen or that it wouldn't be serious. They were just wrong about literally everything and everyone who's seeing the reality is starting to understand that. And a lot of people have seen that on a smaller scale. It hasn't been the entire country turning into a fascist you know, dictatorship, but they've seen it you know, in their job at work. They've been aggravated with new laws that get passed that make it harder for them to do their jobs. Uh, so I think it is coming, and um, that's why I'm trying to be a voice for it, because I feel like, um, you know, th th there's a lot of anger that's going to be coming down the pipe, and it's important to harness that anger and aim it at the right targets, because just anger in itself or just looking for vengeance in itself isn't going to get us anywhere. We need people who are mad at the right people who have destroyed our lives and you know, just done this forever. So I think so. I think it's coming. Yeah, I have a question about the motivations behind these regulations. Um, what do you think about the idea of big businesses using regulations not to make society safer, but to crush their smaller upstarts? 
Yeah, I mean, I don't, there used to be tons of power line contractors in this state, and now there's only a few. It's mostly utilities now, and a lot of that has been through excessive regulations. In the trucking industry, there are barely any owner operators left. Everyone has to go work for a company now. Um, you know, and a lot of that is due to taxes and insurance and increased regulations. Um, and, you know, like with the lockdowns, you didn't really see the big corporations having an issue with it, mostly because they got bailed out and they didn't have to follow the same rules that we did. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly it, that it's not about, you know, making the world a better place. It's just about centralizing control and crushing your opposition. Um, so I work in the electrical field with a lot of blue collar workers and I was wondering how you supposed to uh, reach them instead of voting Republican to vote like libertarian or get liberty candidates in there. Yeah, so I'd say most of my viewers used to be Republicans or are Republicans who are interested in what I have to say. I think the, you know, it, it's a sliding scale. So like 20 years ago, it was probably a lot easier to reach someone on the left because 20 years ago, the left was more about free speech and about hands off my body. I can do what I want, you know, for legalizing drugs or gay marriage or whatever. And uh, then also like on the wars, like they were at least against, you know, the Iraq war that George Bush started. Um, but now I think it's the opposite. I think now, Republicans are a lot easier to reach because they're getting crushed. I mean, that, that's really what it is. Like, I don't have too much optimism that the Republicans have learned their lesson. Like, if they get back, I mean, you just have to go back two years ago. They had, a, you know, they didn't have a majority, but they had more power than the Democrats, and they still passed trillions of dollars of bailouts and, you know, kept the wars going and increased gun laws, all that stuff. But, uh, Whichever side is being subjugated loves the idea of liberty, right? Like, once you have the power, liberty sounds fake and gay. You're just like, nah, like, I don't want to deal with that. But <laughs> if you're the one who's being crushed, then liberty sounds great. Um, so I think, uh, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the guys that I worked with when I was in the electrical industry, they cared about gun rights. Um, you look at the Republicans right now, they're not standing very strong on gun rights. Uh, you just show them all their money that they sent, you know, that most of the Republicans voted for to send to Ukraine $40 billion or whatever. And then you just go back to 2020 and say, what the hell did the Republicans do for you back then? Did they end the lockdowns? Did they, you know, stop these massive bailouts? Like, they, they voted for all of it. So I think it's important to just be blatantly honest with people, I got friends in the audience here that I was blatantly honest with about Trump, and I didn't make any of those individuals feel like idiots themselves, because I don't think they were. Just talked to them like they were real people, and just told them that these guys don't care about you, and they'll sell you out at every turn, and you know that's what I find to be the most effective way to talk to those people. Reed, I really appreciate your comments about overregulation in the business world. How does that connect to your philosophy on the free state project, as far as maybe community politics or you know what I'm saying? Uh, is there any place for political regulation at all? If there is, where is that? So. I'm mostly about getting rid of dumb laws. I mean, if there's a law that makes sense, it's not as big of a deal. Like, I mean, I know we're kind of libertarians or anarchist leaning, but I think we'd all admit that a law that makes sense isn't as bad as a law that doesn't make sense. So like murder being illegal isn't a huge problem we need to deal with right now. That's not a law I'm super big on repealing. Um, so, if there's like a rule against dumping toxic sludge into a river or something like that, like I'm not gung-ho to get rid of that regulation. I think the problem with that type of thing is that the definition of a river gets expanded so much. And I think this is, this is not a bug of the state, but a feature. Like that's what it's kind of, that's what the state is designed to do. It's designed to just increase its power no matter what you do. 
Um, I think the best thing we can do is give people the agency to sue uh, companies that damage their property. Like right now, the EPA actually protects large corporations, like the BP oil spill that happened in the Gulf. Uh, they capped the damages that people could sue for against BP, and BP is still a company today because of that. They should have gotten, you know, put out of business over that, but they weren't. Uh, so I think, you know, really returning to property rights and giving people, you know, complete ownership over everything they have, and if people destroy it, uh, giving them recourse to, you know, get back what is rightfully theirs is uh, the way to go. But um, as far as the Free State Project goes, I think, I don't know if anyone in the crowd remembers the specifics, but I remember DeSantis a few months ago, he was threatening to kick OSHA out of Florida over something. I don't remember what it was. It was something related to the vaccines or something. I forget exactly what it was. But if you can do that, like we should do that here in New Hampshire, in my opinion. I think we should try to kick OSHA out of the Free State. So. Uh, anyone got one more question? We got time for one more. It's all good. Thanks, guys. I, it's really. <laughs> it's really cool to be up here giving a speech. Uh, you know, Clint and I have kind of come out of nowhere around the same time. Like two years ago, I was nobody, or a little bit more than two years ago, but I was absolutely nobody. And now I'm giving a speech here and selling shirts and I'm going down to, I'm going out to Vegas in a couple of weeks and down to Florida in a couple months. And this is just really great. And I really appreciate everyone who watches the show, who supports me in any way. I wouldn't be here without you guys. So thanks for everything.